Um, so we're just going to start by introducing ourselves. So I'm Leila Wuzia. My book, Not Quite White, uh, came out a couple of weeks ago, as was mentioned. My background is as a musician and a theatre maker, and I also write a lot and do a lot of things on my Instagram channel where I have multiple bonkers TV shows. Uh, let's pass around, uh, Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha and I'm a writer, activist and broadcaster. And most of my work is actually in mental health. I go into schools and colleges throughout the world and work with 14 to 18 year olds. But going around the world and seeing the kind of patterns in the way that mental health issues manifest in different groups in society turned me into an equalities activist. <laughs> so now I, I campaign for structural changes that hopefully make the world a, a fairer place. And um, I also wrote this book um, <laughs> called Toxic. It's a novel and both of the, the <laughs> thank you, Leila, uh, both of the, the main characters in the book are of mixed ethnic heritage, which um, I'm sure we will get onto and really happy to be here. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jackson and um, so I'm the son of Japanese immigrants on my mom's side and then my dad's a dude from Dearborn, Michigan. Um, and uh, I just had two books come out in like five months of each other. Um, a short story collection called Counterfactual Love Stories, which is about what it means to be mixed race in the American Midwest. Um, but it also explores the different ways in which stories can be told, which obviously doubles as the different ways in which to be mixed. So like, you know, one story could be told backwards or it could be told in footnotes or it could be told to ransom notes. And then I had a novel that just dropped at the end of April called um, Amnesia of Junebugs. Um, thank you so much. Uh, there it is. Um, and it's about four um, BIPOC characters, um, three of them Asian, whose lives sort of intersect on the New York subway right before Hurricane Sandy. Two things about that, it's told backwards and it's divided into the four stages of the um, insect life cycle. So that's kind of conceptual, again, experimental. And then I have a memoir that's coming out in two weeks called Dream Pop Origami. That's basically a choose your own adventure memoir um, about mixed race identity, Asian masculinity, love and travel. Um, and I moved back to LA after I realized I don't want to be in academia. And here I am reuniting with a friend I met in Philadelphia. So. Yay, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here, joining me on this uh, night of chat. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my book first, and uh, my kind of understanding of my mixedness. So uh, the way that I experienced my mixedness actually not reflected in my book, and I'm going to explain why. So the way that I feel about being mixed is the best way I can describe it is like a constellation. So you have different stars that make up the picture and each star has its own kind of internal life. You know, some stars that we see in the sky are already dead. They're too far away. Some are much closer to us. Some have moons and um, some are near other stars. Some are in solar systems, some are in other galaxies, whatever. They all have their own individual thing as a star, but all together, they make up the constellation. So when we look at the constellation, we're not thinking about each individual star so much as we're just seeing that one picture. That's how I feel about my different strands of heritage and culture and the different timelines and countries and everything that has converged in me. So I think I came to that understanding quite early in life, but had no way to articulate it even now that kind of image is like the easiest way for me to describe it and it's not really summed up by the word mixed which doesn't really tell you anything apart from not not a mono ethnicity or <laughs> i don't know the term but that framework is because it's how i see myself it's actually how i see everything so it's how i understand time to work it's how i understand faith and religion and spirituality to work it's how i understand um, sexuality, gender, people's experiences, even um, just going about life is how I understand everything to work. And as an artist and a creator, I use that perspective 
in my artworks. So in my songs that I write, in my shows that I've produced, in the artwork I have made, I've always, always, always used that perspective. And I have a long section in my book where I talk about as a teenager being drawn to works that I felt in some way also represented that framework, that sort of everything happening at once framework. So I talk about the book House of Leaves, which is very important to me as a teenager, talk about some of the operas and some of the sort of postmodern countercultural stuff that I was interested in. Anyway, when I came to write my book, it was the first thing I had made that does not use that framework. And the reason for that was because I realized People don't have that same framework as me. Not everyone sees the world in this way. And that was a really difficult thing to learn because I was like, this is just how I see the world. How is there any other way of seeing the world? Like, what are people doing? This doesn't make any sense. And so when I realized that, which is actually through my Instagram and through doing later lectures, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I'm over here essentially, like, multiplying 12 by 12. And other people are like on the one and one is two level. So in, I was trying to have conversations about stuff like race and society and dismantling structures. And it was like, it was, it was too somehow complex uh, for people to follow. And I realized that was to do with the way that I see things as default. Like I didn't learn to see this way. It was just the way that I do. And so in my book, I made an effort to tell my story in a linear fashion. So it starts when I'm four, it ends when I'm in my late twenties. And I feel like really the only, there are parts in the book where I start to bring in this framework. I do what I call time traveling, where I zoom in and out of things or I move around a little bit, but I wrote the book to be understood by other people. There was no need to write it for me because I already feel and understand the way that I am. So lots of people have been like, oh, did you write it for your younger version of you? And the answer is no. I already understand how I feel. There was no need to write that for me. I wrote it for other people to understand. And the way that I see my book, chapter 10 really is the only chapter that starts to express things the way that I see them or I understand them. Really, chapters one to nine are just sort of context. They're like the intro of how do you make this framework? How can you experience the framework of how I see things? And I wrote that because I thought if there's any mixed people out there that are struggling to understand themselves or they're struggling to understand their own framework or they're struggling to understand how can I be all these things at the same time? It doesn't make any sense. Maybe this will be, as I said in the book, like a map of how I got to where I am Maybe it can work for you. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? We'll see. And so that was my kind of background of why I chose the narrative I did for my book, even though it's not the narrative, uh, it's not the framework I use when I see other, other art. And that's why I chose that. So I wanted to talk kind of about just frameworks for understanding mixed people and mixed experiences in general. And I think it's, it's important um, to express that even though it can be kind of like a point of interest to talk about these things, like, oh, isn't it fascinating how different people see different things? The effects are actually much greater than just a sort of, um, you know, theoretical, hypothetical conversation. Because if you don't understand how to see yourself, that has really very real visceral consequences um, in terms of your, your, mental health, your like identity, who you are, how you govern yourself. And so I think it's important to understand why we are talking about frameworks for understanding mixed people. It's not just from the point of view of like, oh, isn't it interesting how we all came to things differently, but also it does have a very real impact on people who have no other framework to understand themselves. And there's not that many, maybe more so now, but there's not traditionally like many frameworks given to you by society, a lot of representations of mixed people, they focus on things like how is a mixed family placed into a society? Or they focus on what are the specific countries you're from and how do they interact? And I always think of those as being concerns really of people who are not mixed. They're, they're sort of almost of more interest, obviously they have an impact on you, but they sort of of more interest of people looking in to the mixed world rather than if you are a mixed person, how you look out. And so I just wanted to explain why I think it's important that we're talking about these things today. Um, and I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sort of 
the idea of different frameworks that we have so far, kind of like psychologically understood. But I just want to stop and uh, give Jackson and Natasha a chance to chime in because we've been rambling on for a bit. Um, I think I've been on such a journey with this. I actually had a couple of sessions of therapy, which I do all the time. Like, you know, it's not it's not a um, a, a kind of big deal for me. But I did have a couple of, of sessions of therapy to to try and help me establish um, what where I was on the whole race thing, because I think the first thing to to establish is that Britain is not particularly sophisticated in its thinking about race. I feel like America has a, a much more inclusive framework for, for thinking about racial difference and racial diversity. Here in the UK, the amount of times I hear black, white, and Asian, and I'm like, right, so two arbitrary racial categorizations, which actually no one uh, no one is those two colors and then a continent and and those are the three things that you can be and you have to pick which one are you and obviously you know you're always hyper aware that that race is to a large extent a social construct so what i was doing was i was allowing other people's perception of me to determine how i felt about myself and i was kind of going well i guess if if those are the three options then then I'm white because that's what I look most like. And, but then I was very aware that I was kind of erasing a whole part of my identity and upbringing and, and my makeup. And I was carrying around a lot of confusion and guilt about that. So now I think what I tend to do is I wait for people to tell me how they see me, but I don't let that infect, affect me internally. I'm at peace with who I am and all the different aspects. And I love the way that you describe it like stars in a constellation. There are so many layers to all of us and I've kind of made peace with that. But I also think that in many ways it's a gift and, it, and it's something that I've spoken to um, my brothers about as, as well. One of them in particular, we look very alike and we're kind of ethnically ambiguous. And that means that people make guesses about where they think we're from. And then their behavior changes based on those guesses. And you can actually tell a lot about a person from what they guess and how that affects what they say and how they behave. So for me, it's become almost like I can sort of sit back and um, I guess it, as a writer, as a kind of social commentator, use people's reactions to my identity to learn about the world. And, and that's kind of where I am with it. Mm. Yeah, um, so it's interesting. I grew up and I always knew I was part Japanese, but I never thought I was Asian because I didn't think I was allowed to call myself Asian. You know what I mean? Because I mean, my Obacha was born in Japan. She read Japanese. My mom is like, you know, mixed like me. She doesn't read Japanese, I, you know, but I never allowed myself to actually claim that because of, you know, phenotypic reasons. I was like, well, I don't have that right. And for a long time, I didn't feel like I was even allowed to like, you know, tell when I was, you know, Asian, part Asian. And then in 2006, I was in New York and I was going through Tower Records, rest in peace, my friend. Um, and uh, they had a book section and it was a, there was a book called Hapa by Kip Fulbeck. And he basically just takes mixed race people who are basically Asian and either several different Asian like strands or like Asian white, but all these different permutations of like mixed race identity that are at least part Asian. And I saw a boy that looked just like me, you know, and I started crying in the middle of this fucking bookstore. You know what I mean? And this is New York, like no one cries. And when they do, when you do cry, everyone pretends not to notice that you're crying, right? So it's even more isolating, right? So you're sitting there crying and you're, and you're feeling how everyone's getting really emotionally awkward. But then I realized that even though the word wouldn't be perfect forever, there was actually a word to describe my complex racial, emotional, and, you know, cultural identity. And it was a word that was, you know, coalescing as opposed to like dividing. It was instead of being fractional, right? It was like suturing. And, th and that's what I needed so desperately, a language to explain my, my sort of complex hybrid reality. Um, and unfortunately we live in a society that's so antiquated in its understanding of race, right? And cultural and gender identity, for example, that we're so far behind that we will, we will you know, grab the closest word that comes closest to honoring our complex subjectivity, right? 
uh, even if it's not a perfect fit. Um, and because we lack that sort of language of ontology, you know, we lack the language of our existence and its complexity. So um, I feel like half my life has been trying to be feel like a whole person, right, in a world of fractions. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's, I think that the fraction thing as well, like that's something that I really stumbled on as a child because it comes from, you know, people like, oh, you're half your mom, half your dad. That's, at least that's how it began for me. And then it was like trying to understand, okay, so, but if my mom is like 10% this, does that mean I'm 5%? And it just got so convoluted and it, it doesn't, I think this, this whole fraction thing, I, I've really grown to think that actually all of the words we use to describe mixed people are kind of useless. They don't really tell you anything. And, um, you know, even the term mixed, I say mixed now almost intentionally because it is also the vaguest <laughs> and the broadest and the most meaningless, but it's kind of like, if you're understanding people as complex, nuanced people with their own stories, their own identities, it's not helpful to just sort of group you in one, in one big thing. And when I found the sort of different frameworks that psychologists have, have discovered or discovered is wrong word, but have sort of uh, documented mixed people he's using, that actually felt a lot truer to me. So I thought I'd just quickly run through those now. So you may have come across these, um, but for our audience, if you don't know, these are the sort of border crossing layout as given by Maria Root, who is an academic, who's done a lot of work about mixed people. And um, she's based in America. So a lot of her work centers Filipino Americans and Asian Americans have people, but I found it so relevant to my own understanding of race when I was doing research for this book originally. So she kind of gives a framework of four different ways people tend to um, experience being mixed. So if you imagine each part of your ethnic cultural makeup to be a different camp, I'm going to come back to that word camp, the first way you can experience is to kind of have both feet in both camps or all feet in all camps if you have more than two. She says both feet in both camps, but this was the 90s, so fine. But <laughs> now we can accept people with more than two, two different things exist. So the first is to have all feet in all camps and you, um, she uses the term, suggests the ability to hold, merge and respect multiple perspectives simultaneously, which I love that. When I first read that in the British Library, I was like, oh my God. I, had a, I did a huge accent. I was basically tearing up in the library. The second method she suggests is the individual kind of shifts which aspect of her identity is in the forefront based on what context you're in. So if you're in a situation where you're talking to a lot of people from camp A, instead of being like, I'm camp A, B, C, I have th three feet in three camps all at the same time, you might be like, oh yeah, camp A, I get that, blah, blah, blah. And I think that method, we also, we sometimes hear words like, chameleon or code switching, which I don't know how helpful those terms are, but I think that kind of speaks to that method. The third method is somebody who sits decisively on the border of those camps. So right at those points where they meet and you kind of refuse to go into one camp fully, you, you sit directly in between them and you sort of self-designate, I am here on the corners of camp A, B, C, D, whatever camps you have. And the fourth way of dealing with this is to set up camp specifically in one of those camps. So rather than being in all of them, rather than going between them, rather than being between um, directly in the middle equidistant, you are like, yeah, I'm camp A. And I'm maybe camp B, I'm camp C, I'm aware of, but I'm mostly camp A. And in my experience, most of the mixed people I've met or have talked to have found ways of incorporating those first two kind of experiences. So either feeling like they go between their different parts of their identity or feeling like they're all of them all at the same time, which is how I feel. And I actually, just, just before Christmas, when I was just about to hand this book in, was the first time I met someone who I would say is that fourth way where they are like in one camp and don't really associate with the two. And I was like, this is fascinating. I could talk to you all night. Wow, you are the fourth kind of Maria Roots podcast. Anyway. So I think those frameworks, I don't think mixed um, frameworks are limited to those four, but I do think they're a helpful starting point because 
you can see, oh yeah, that's why with some mixed people, I really feel like just straight away connect because we experience things in the same way. Um, with some people, it maybe takes a bit longer and you're like, oh wow, so you're mixed, you know, maybe you're technically the same ethnicities as me or you're technically similar race to me or whatever, but we don't experience this in the same way at all. And I think that is because the frameworks for us to understand ourselves have not historically been based on how we see ourselves, but based on how we are understood from the outside. And so I feel that could be just outlining those could just be a useful way to sort of for us to talk a little bit more generally about how we maybe came to our frameworks or like how those frameworks impact our creative life, how we maybe take those with us if we're aware of them impacting that kind of thing. So yeah, I just wanted to give an outline. I don't know if either of you has come across those before. I haven't, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And I also think that, um, you know, a big, a big part of the race discussion is, is culture as mm. well. And um, one of the things that I wanted to explore in the novel and something that has been, um, I guess, a struggle in my own life is what happens when you have no connection to the part of your heritage or to either part of your heritage or any part of your heritage? Mm. What happens when you don't, you know, know about the, the food that that part of your heritage would eat or the, the books or the, the art or the just the, the ways of life? Um, and I actually, the reason that I kind of crystallized my thoughts around this, I watched, I don't know if you've seen that Channel 4 show, um, The School That Tried to End Racism. Yeah. Right. I have, yeah. So, um, so it's do a you remember British what, show. We'll have to send it to you, Jackson. Yeah, we'll send, we'll send it to you. It's a really interesting. It's a really interesting show, and there's there's a girl in it called um, Farah who um, I really related to a lot, and um, she her her mother is white British. Her father is from Sri Lanka. And she describes herself as having olive skin. And then there's a moment in the, the documentary where they, they separate the children into, they say, right, if you're white British, you're going into this racial affinity group. And if you're anything other than that, you're in another affinity group. They call it BAME, which is not a term that I'm particularly enamored with. And you can see this look of total horror on Farah's face where she's like, I don't know which one to go into. And then there's a point where the the non-white group say to her, you belong with us. That's the words that they use. They say, you belong with us. And she just looks so um, relieved and happy that she's been accepted into that group. Um, but that wasn't the, actually the, the part of this documentary that I was thinking of when I was talking about culture. The part I was thinking of was um, all of these children, and they're in year seven, so they're like 11, 12 years old. They had to bring in uh, something that represented their culture for them. So you had, there were some um, Muslim students who were bringing in kind of prayer mats and they were explaining about how they're used and how they're made. And then there were some children of um, East African heritage that were uh, bringing in some jewelry that, you know, had belonged to their grandparents and they were showing how it's worn and what it's for and what it symbolizes. And they were all just incredibly articulate and, and at home with being able to do that. And then the white British children which it were like, uh, I've brought in a Bible, don't really know why. It's just the only thing I could think of. Um, and they were, they were kind of, they'd never been asked to be demonstrative about their, their culture before because it, you know, they're enmeshed in it, they're surrounded by it. Mm -hmm. But it also got me thinking about whether having that really strong sense of cultural identity and being connected to your roots is kind of a form of privilege. And, and so that's why I created the character of Luella, the, the, the main character in my book, who is, she's of, of mixed heritage, but she's being raised by a white parent and she doesn't know her father. And so she has no connection to that side of her heritage at all, because I wanted to explore what happens when you know that you are, you fall outside the, the white experience, but you don't have, anything to cushion you, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know, mm. sort of in conversation to that, I've, I've been thinking a lot about um, who gets to make these rules of how we identify. And um, I think for most of my life, I didn't think I had that right. You know what I mean? I think one of the massive mistakes I made was 
sort of catering to the white gaze, you know, and making decisions about my own racial culture and everything based on how people see me. We can obviously understand how problematic that is. And, and it was revolutionary. It shouldn't be, but it's revolutionary to me when one of my friends was like, Jackson, you get to decide how you identify. And I was like, really? You know what I mean? Like I seriously was like, mm -hmm. I get to just, I get to make these decisions. And they're like, yes, in fact, you have to make that decision. And until you make the decision, someone else will make it for you, right? And this is how cultures are. People don't wait. They categorize, they incorrectly analyze based on a super deficient knowledge of your like background, your family, everything. And um, you almost have to jump in front of other people who will try to do the work for you. And, and what I sort of took me a long time to realize is that I can do that and I can also change my answer which is shocking. Like the idea that you could be racially fluid didn't even occur to me until, you know, I was code switching with one of my friends. You know what I mean? Like I was with a bunch of my Asian American friends and we were talking and I realized we we're talking very differently, you know? And then I would hang out with other friends of mine, whether they're Latina, Latino or black, whatever. We also would change register and stuff like that. And I'd been doing this for half of my life, you know, making conscious decisions about how I want to interact, the language we decide on. Um, but it, it's worth pointing out that most mixed race people don't actually feel like it's even their choice. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a terrible tragedy. You know what I mean? To be like, someone's like, you're not white, you're not black, you're not mixed. You know, I've had people tell me you're not Asian. And because I didn't have an answer, I was like, shit, you're right. Maybe I'm not, you know, I've had people say you're not white because, you know, your grandmother doesn't even speak English that well. And I was like, shit, you know, and I kept being subject to other people's racial, you know, conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, and so until we decide how we want to identify, I think there's a lot of violence get, that gets done to mixed race people who are pushed constantly in places that honestly, they, we don't even want to go. And it's the gaslighting as well. I think this was something that I saw really clearly with how Meghan Markle was treated while she was here in the UK, mm -hmm. where, because the, the people who are really good at spotting any kind of deviation from whiteness are racist, right? So uh, immediately she, she was identified by racists as being not white, as being other, as seen as somebody who was kind of infiltrating the, the ethnic line of the, the royal family and experienced just so much racism and so blatant as, as well um, in the way that she was described and, and portrayed. And, and it, was, it was awful. But then because she is a light-skinned Black woman, when we tried to talk about that, when anyone tried to talk about that, you also had a group of people that went, oh, is she, is she makes her, I didn't even notice. I just, you know, I, I don't see color. I didn't even think about it. But, and so it's, you know, you've got that dual experience of, experiencing racism on the one hand, and then the people who should be your allies kind of going, nah, no, no, no you didn't. And that's really discombobulating to, to almost kind of get it from, from both sides. And I, re I felt for Meghan Markle so much with, with the experiences that she had with the UK media in particular, and I don't blame her at all for going back to the States. No, I don't know. Yeah, not for one second. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's interesting because I think so much of it is the understanding of mixedness comes from whiteness because so much of our understanding of race is just so rooted in white supremacy. It's like you can't, you know, if you try and talk about these terms, or you try and deconstruct them, you just end up at the same point, which is like all of the terms sort of serve to underline a white majority, even terms like people of color, people of... Um, the global majority, uh, I'm trying to think of other terms like BIPOC or BAME, which again, like, you know, they all have their problems, but it's like they all only make sense within a white framework. If you take out a sort of white group, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what does people of color of mean? That's literally every other person in yeah. the world. Like, it yeah. doesn't, who is that applying to? You know, it doesn't, they don't serve us. And I think, that was an interesting one for me because I realized I, um, I since like my earliest memories have always been perceived as not white, which I, even though I'm, I'm quite light skinned, I think it is a name 
appearance combination. I think if I was called like Anne Smith, it might be different, <laughs> which it's, I'm glad I'm not. Like I love being called Leila Bouzier, but I think it is, it is the two. Or if I was called Leila Bouzier and I was like, I don't know, I had blonde, brown hair and blue eyes or something, maybe that would also fit. So I think it's those two things. But anyway, so I've never had the experience of feeling white passing because people have always been, you're not one of us. Where are you from? You're obviously not from here. You are different, blah, blah, blah. Even in the compliments, they just serve to underline the same thing. And as I got older, I realized so many of my mixed friends have found it difficult to claim um, their other, their ethnicity or their backgrounds or whatever for similar reasons as what you were speaking to Jackson, because they've always been pushed. They've always had whiteness pushed on them. So they will say, oh, well, because my name is like Steph or whatever, or my name is Claire, I think I'm just white passing. So I'm basically white passing. So I can't identify with your experiences as a mixed person, Layla. And I'd be like, okay, but you are still mixed. Like maybe you can't identify with my experiences, but it doesn't change that there's something similar between us, which these other white people don't share. And that was quite, quite a weird wake up call for me because I was like, oh, wow. Like, the whiteness is so pervasive. It's like infiltrated how you relate to yourself, like in your own private inner world. It's almost like, hesitate to use this kind of language, but it's almost been like corrupted or like polluted by the sort of strain of whiteness that is then stopping you from feeling able to claim those other aspects or able to seek them out. And so I think, I think it's interesting as well that you're, examining that further in your work, Natasha, like, you know, what does happen? Where does this go? And there was a moment when I was reading your book or listening, I should say, I listened to the audio book because, you know, that's my jam when it comes to nonfiction. And um, there was this moment where you were talking about when, and I, I hate this word, but this is how it would be described by the beauty industry, when exotic features became mm. fashionable, when, they became attainable through through things like you know surgery and hair extensions and uh, and fake tan etc. And because they could be bought by white people, they suddenly became the beauty paradigm. Mm. And I related to that so much because I because it made me think of um, I wrote this this blog about um, how like my face has always looked like this. <laughs> and when I was at school, I used to be really teased in particular for having big lips. I, I used to be mm. really teased about it to the extent that when I raised my hand in class to ask a question, I, I used to put my hand in front of my face like this to ask, because I was so self-conscious of people looking at my lips and, and the teasing that I used to receive. And then at some point um, in my kind of, I guess, early twenties, it switched and, and big lips became a, a thing. Um, and now I'm, I'm at the stage where, you know, people ask me where I got them done. And, and I have to say, you know, very exclusive clinic, my mother's womb, you know. <laughs> 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 but, um, That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I remember I wrote a blog about it. And, and the point of the blog was that, you know, beauty paradigm shift. And, and I was kind of, and I was, I guess I was trying to say in a sort of lighthearted way, if, if you're just yourself, eventually you will come into fashion at some point. But then I, I ended up um, going on uh, daytime TV to, to talk about something entirely different, but the, the, you know, they have these debates. I'm sure they have them in the States as, as well, Jackson, mm -hmm. which it's just completely pointless. And it's, you know, it's designed to create tension because everybody mm -hmm. just wants to be an argument. And the, the woman that I, I was in the debate with said, you know, I read a blog that you wrote about your lips being your favorite feature, but you know, what, what am I supposed to do? I wasn't born with your big lips, Natasha. I wasn't born with your curvy bust. So, you know, and she was basically defending the fact that she'd had loads of plastic surgery as, as a white woman, which, you know, whatever, it's her body, she can do whatever she wants with it. But my point was, but you, yeah, you've had lip fillers because you weren't born with, with big lips, but you haven't had the struggle of being othered and teased for, mm. for it. And, and she completely missed the, the point that I was trying to make, that, that you feel like something's been taken from you when people are approximating your features. And, and, then, and then you get told how lucky you are. And so you feel guilty for, for having that, that resentment. So when you wrote about that with your hair and about 
white women in toilets refusing to believe that you didn't have hair extensions in. Um, I related to that so much. Mm. And it was one of those moments where I thought, I thought I was the only person in the world who'd ever had that feeling. And mm. there were, then there you were another human kind of expressing it so well. Mm. And it, it's such a weird thing. So it's, it's that weird appropriation of how you look with, as you say, absolutely none of the context and it's like we've seen this now with the sort of fake tan debate um you know people like jesse nelson ariana grande and this that and the other and it's kind of like almost appropriating an entire look and and genre for like what purpose like to sell stuff basically and it's like whereas we've had this um like i say in my book like my skin has been a point of contention with basically everyone I've ever met for my entire life. So the idea that it can also just be like a marketing prop is like, so uh, it's sort of really dehumanizes you in a very uncomfortable way. And I, I think I had the, a similar reaction to you where I was annoyed about it, but I didn't have the guilt. I went straight to anger <laughs> and I was like, I'm so angry with everyone that this is happening. I think I did this really long chat with my Instagram followers about fake tan. And I was like, this is not okay. I don't think everyone understands what's going on here. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It produces a lot of anger, but I think the when we don't have any form of sort of stories or representation or pushback on these topics at all, kind of in mainstream media, it's difficult when if you're, you know, especially if you're a young person growing up and you're still working out, how do I feel about myself? You don't have anything to latch onto or to say like, Hey, if you feel like this, it's okay. You know, I was also in my twenties when sort of like the Kardashian people came to prominence and, and that was like the in look. But if I had been a teenager at that time, I think I would have been really confused. You know, I would have been hit with messages of like, Oh, now you're really pretty. Oh, you were really ugly, but now you're really, now you're really pretty, blah, blah. And, there's no sort of framework for understanding that. And I think for me, when I talk about needing more representation or wanting to hear more mixed stories, that is what I mean. I mean, I want to, I want people to know there are different ways to feel about things and different ways to respond to things. And it's not one singular experience. And how can we hear more of those stories? And so I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of what, what ways you both, or I guess all of us, but you both feel you are telling those different kinds of stories in your work. So obviously, and there's like a practical sense, like you just wrote your book, but I don't know, in a more <laughs> cerebral sense as well, Jackson's wrote multiple books, but like in the, in the different ways you feel you are pushing those forwards. And if you feel like it comes from a personal place or I don't know, a sort of purposeful I don't know how that how that interacts with your work. Yeah, I've, I've noticed um, in retrospect that almost all my creative work is quasi experimental. You know, it's very conceptual. Um, that's partially because I think that's how I understand my own sort of mixed race identity. You know what I mean? As mm -hmm. uh, an experiment. You know what I mean? In the beginning, an experiment done on me and mixed race people, but then ultimately my attempt to experiment with reality and understand who I am and my own sort of specific definitions and terms. Um, but I also think that part of me consciously wanted to resist like um, the expectant narrative cult of linearity because linearity, which I love, I feel is often pushed on people to appeal to a particular readership, you know what I mean? And it's not for usually the best reasons. And if you can do both, I say, do it, write the story in the way that you want to write it, you know what I mean, for sure. But when I tried writing linear narratives, whether it's short stories or like memoirs, I felt almost pushed to do it. You know, I felt like I was being expected to make coherence of my own mixed identity for the comfort and consumption of white readers, you know? and I. I didn't want to feel that way. I wanted to tell a story in a way that was complicating and confusing and that I could do justice to. And if I could do a linear narrative, I would have, trust me, because I would have, you know, I would have found more readers and probably connected. But I feel like telling mixed race artists to tell the stories in the way that they need to tell them is the most generous advice we can do. You know what I mean? So that they don't feel this expectation, whatever 
whatever narrative modality is pushed on them, they can be like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not telling my story in your way. You know what I mean? I'm telling my story in the way that I feel I need to tell it in order for it to make sense to me, um, in order for you to connect to the writing. And I feel like as artists, that's an amazing gift that I wish people had told us way earlier. You know what I mean? Um, because there are all these genres in the beginning, we feel like we have to tell the story in a particular way. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And our complexity has to be like the, the apex of the narrative, you know what I mean? Like, and then I realized, you know what I mean, who I am um, or whatever. And I think that did a lot of damage to me because I felt like I wasn't an artist for a long time because I couldn't write a traditional short story mm. um, at all. It's so interesting you say that because I almost feel the opposite. I felt like the linear path of telling my story was the, was the easiest way. And if I had written other books, I think I would have gone more conceptual because my stage work and my music work and my songs are all like super high concept to the point where I think they have alienated a lot of potential audience who are like, I can't, what is going on? Like, I enjoy it, but I have no idea what it means. Like one of my long-term collaborators actually said that to me once. We did like our 10th show together and was like, I love everything we're doing, but I, I do not get it. <laughs> and I was like, great. But I, I was like, if I was a better writer, I could write a different book. But I, I thought the, the following a linear, for me, it was like, this is the easiest way to take the audience on this journey with me as well, so that they understand what I am trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I had the same fear as you. I didn't want it to be like, and then I discovered myself at the end. So all of the things that I uncover in the final chapter, um, which is also the most conceptual, like there's a lot about colonialism and there's a lot about indentured labor. And I use a lot of imagery for those things because otherwise I was like, this is too cerebral. This is basically the whole chapter is just in my head. So I was like, I need much more imagery. And then I, I laced them back through the book so that actually a lot of those images, like there's a tiger's roar and cats and all this kind of, they start off in the early chapters, but they just feel a bit janky. Like you don't really know what they are. And then, the audience learns what they are at the end. But instead of being like, and then I found these things, it's more like they were always here and you're just finding them now, but they were actually always here in me. And for me, I felt like um, that was the best way with my limited writing skills, I could get across what I was trying to in the form of a book. And it was actually a relief when I would finish writing the book, I was like, okay, I'm, I don't need to explain it all again. Like if anyone asks me in the future, I don't understand your work, it's too conceptual. I can be like, here's the non-conceptual version. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go back to telling the same story in the, in the different fragmented ways that it exists for me. So I, um, I read Natalie Morris's book, um, mm. which I know you have as well, Leila, um, called Mixed Other. Get that off the shelf. And <laughs> I love how you have all of these books like <laughs> ready to, to show. Yeah, really yeah, great book, uh, recommend. And, um, and one of the first points that she makes is, um, you know, when somebody thinks of a mixed person, they think of somebody with my mix. And, and she has a, a white mother and a Caribbean father. And that is true that, that if you say mixed person to to most people, they think of somebody who um, has one white parent and then one parent who is either African or, or Caribbean. They think of a, a mix of white and black. Um, and then she says, but actually, if you think about it, there are all of these infinite other ways that a person can, can be mixed. And she interviews 50 other people of various other mixes. And, um, and that really uh, you know, spoke to me, but it also got me thinking. So in um, Toxic, um, Luella, she, all she knows about her dad is that he is from somewhere in Asia, <laughs> huge, um, and but she thinks it's probably South Asia because of the way that that she looks, because of you know her physical features. Um, but the the girl that she befriends and they become really tight and they become a, kind of um, enmeshed in their difference. Um, and it's it's interesting. So that the the girl that she becomes friends with called is called Aretha, and she is that typical mix of white and Caribbean and her father is very present and loving and you know they're cooking ackee and saltfish together and um and she's very connected to that part of her her heritage and um and so 
she comes to Luella's school and Luella, who attends a, a, a predominantly white school, uh, lives in a predominantly white neighborhood, has always felt, I guess, like an inch away from white. So sort of almost, but you know, not, not quite. Um, sees this person who wears her difference proudly and celebrates it and goes, okay, I want some of that. And that's what attracts her to Aretha. And that's where the bond is formed. And then as, you know, without spoiling the book or the novel, that as their story plays out, they realize that they actually have less in common than um, they thought they did. And there are, there are lots of um, reasons that they don't actually like each other that much. And, uh, you know, the, there's lots of points I'm trying to make, but, but one of them is that just because somebody is mixed, you might have a, a lot superficially in common with them, but that doesn't, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the foundation for a really meaningful friendship. <laughs> mm. I think for me, it's, I've, I've kind of come to the understanding of the mixed friendships that have felt the most, um, I don't know what the word is, like nourishing for me is a, people who have that same kind of viewpoint as me, like when we were talking about viewpoints before, and also the friendships I have where the mix is, is quite specific in sort of a political sense. So something I, I talk about this in my book is I have lots of friends where one parent is white and they maybe don't know that parent that well, or that parent might be a bit distant, that parent might have identity issues of their own, the white parent. And then their other parent, like the parent of color, to use that term, is someone who immigrated as an adult from a small, formerly colonized island nation. So in my life, I have a friend who who's, has a Swedish mum and a Sri Lankan dad, and they basically have the same experience as me. I have one of my really good friends who is has a Filipina mum and a white Kiwi dad, but grew up in New York. They have a really similar experience to me. And then we have my experience, which is one book. My dad's from Mauritius. And we have, oh, Jackson just a bit. Um, we have super similar experiences. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we have um, super similar experiences, even though you would never group us together on paper. Like one of us is, is would be happy on paper. I'm like, I don't know, sometimes British, South Asian, sometimes brown, whatever, on, on paper. We never get what my other friend is black. Like you never, they never get grouped together on paper, but we actually have super similar experiences based on, I think the sort of unique identities that come out of those almost, I don't know, political, historical scenarios. And so I think then I would like to see like an increase in, I don't know, terminology or ways that allow us to connect based on those aspects rather than just like, what color are we? Because mm -hmm. I have tons of like brown, Asian, uh, British Asian friends who I have absolutely nothing in common with. Like they grew up in communities with tons of people that look the same as them, or, you know, they grew up just the both parents from the same community, from the same background, blah, blah. And it's like, I don't connect with them at all. And yet, you know, my half a friend from New York who on paper I have nothing in common with, we have so much in common. And that's one of the reasons I, put that terminology in my book and I was everyone kept wanting to take it out they were like this is a bit tangential and I was like I know that this is the part of the book that doesn't serve the narrative but I need it to be in there because if somebody reads this and identifies with it I want them to have this term even if it is one person in the entire world that is like enough and I think I, I really like what you're saying about you know on first glance, oh yeah, we're mixed, we're both mixed, we can be best friends, but then actually as it turns out, you may or may not have a lot in common. And yeah, I love that. Love that for the mixed experience. <laughs> um, so the last kind of thing I want to talk about just briefly, and then we can go to some audience questions, is how, if it has, how your approach has kind of changed during the course of your work, if you feel like you've explored different ways of using your framework or different different narratives and come to a conclusion about anything of how it best serves you or how it best serves your work. I need a moment to think about that question. 
I think you might be on mute, Jackson. Oh yeah, sorry, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll jump into that. I'll give Natasha a little time to come up with an answer. So hmm. I think, um, yeah, a couple of things. One, I, I realized that in retrospect, as I'm analyzing the th what I've written so far, that so much of my understanding of racial identity connects to sort of my narrative style in ways that I didn't think I was aware of and I'm glad to think about it now. So one thing is like um, variability. I'm realizing that I give my readers a lot of choices in which to decide how to navigate my writing, which I think is my attempt to create agency for myself as a mixed race person, right? To be able to decide how I am. And uh, in the short story collection, you can jump from story to story because there's these connective tissues giving you choices as a reader. And in the memoir, um, there's a menu after every chapter that allows you, like, if you want to see Jackson get his heart broken, go to page 45. If you want to see the first time he fell in love. Okay. And again, you're giving readers this agency. And there's a couple of things I, I, I started understanding after I was done with the book that I wasn't aware of when I wrote it, that I think sort of connects to your question. So one thing is um, that the work's never done. But the memoir, my memoir doesn't actually have a beginning and end, you know what I mean? Because if you read it the way I want you to read it, you'll just keep going forever, you know what I mean? Which is how I think work, our work is as mixed race people. It's never finished. There is no perfect beginning and there's no, the endings are arbitrary, you know what I mean? And I think that it has to be that way for so many mixed race people. Um, otherwise, it's sort of superimposed on you from the outside. And I sort of reject those categorical you know, um, identity structures. I think we have to decide them. And I think the other thing is just um, having agency in this discussion is something that seems obvious, but is actually has to be fought for. And there has to be work, I think, required to connect with that. And agency for us, of course, but also different default modes of understanding ourselves outside of just the non-white, because I think it's so easy to just be like, well, I'm not white, you know what I mean? Like, um, and it's liberating because at least we don't have to worry about using another word that's problematic, fraught, dated, whatever. But we still end up centering whiteness even in our categorical re rejection of whiteness. Mm -hmm. So coming up with new modes of identity and art and creation and discourse, right? That doesn't always do it in relation to whiteness is something that I personally am looking forward to sort of co-creating with other mixed race artists, frankly. Thank you, Jackson, for giving me time. To, and that was a super interesting answer as well. Um, I think um, what I realized whilst writing Toxic is that um, you need an anchor or a sort of point from which to work from, but that the answers are never simple. So, um, I saw a lot of conversations, particularly on social media, unfolding about privilege, um, particularly after the murder of George Floyd and, and the resurgence of Black Lives Matter. And they were very centered in colorism and, you know, how, how much shit do you get walking down the street? And, and that kind of determines how um, far away you are from the white experience. And, I think that that can be true and valuable, but it's not the whole story. And, you know, you see that, for example, with um, Ashkenazi Jewish people who are, you know, they're from Europe, they, they are light skinned, and yet they still experience um, prejudice and discrimination. You see that with Gypsy Roma people who, you know, if the categorizations are white, black, and Asian, they're white, and yet it's mm -hmm. certainly here in Britain are some of the most discriminated people we have. Um, and so I, I would see kind of some of the conversations around critical race theory and colorism as an anchor, and then you kind of go from there. And in the book, that's why I introduced the, the character of Steph. Um, so, so Steph is Aretha's brother's girlfriend. She's a dark-skinned black woman. She's very politically aware. And over dinner, she's talking to the girls about critical race theory. And everything that she's saying is true. She's saying, you know, I, as a dark-skinned black woman, will statistically experience more discrimination than either of you because you're, you're both mixed. Um, and, you know, there are layers of privilege. And... It's all true, and and both of those girls take take the conversation and 
interpret it in a different way according to their own experiences and are kind of playing privileged top trumps <laughs> um, throughout mm -hmm. the, the course of the story. And, and what I, the point I'm trying to make there is that, you know, for a lot of people that, you know, I think they're busy or they're just a bit lazy in their thinking and they're like, what, right, what are the rules? When talking about race, what are the rules? What do I need to know? And then done and I get on with it. But because there are so many billions of people in the world who all have their own experiences, you actually, you can't do that. You can, you can use that basic understanding as your anchor, but you have to adapt um, according to, you know, the people that, that you meet and take their experiences into consideration. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's really true. Everyone's making really interesting points. It's like, I don't know where to jump in and pick up on, but I think, I think like trying to meet people on an understanding of we all have such varied experiences. It almost like, for me, I've recently been feeling so kind of almost like bored of the exercise of labels because I understand that they serve a purpose, but it's so, it feels very, um, I don't know what the word is. It feels very lacking and, you know, labels in terms of not just labeling our mixedness, but there's so much labeling of like gender and sexuality and things like this. And I, I think it all serves to take away from what is the individual's unique experience? And when you're talking to someone, especially if you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you don't just want to introduce yourself with a sort of rote list of, oh, I'm this, that, and the other, and I possess this, that, and the other privilege. Like it, it kind of takes away from the point. And it gets to a point of, for me, it feels rooted in both whiteness and the fraction thing. Um, you know, like Natasha, when you mentioned in a sort of wake of George Floyd and we were kind of, I know myself and some of my friends of color, um, we were sort of saying, it feels like white people are just discovering the levels of racism that exist, even though we've been talking about them for a really long time. And it almost became this exercise in like quantification, like how much racism do you experience? How can we quantify it? When did you get called this? When did you get called that? Blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't really, it doesn't work like that. It's not, that's, as you know, that's not how these experiences exist. I had this weird email that I received after my book came out from someone who was like, uh, I think the passage where you're talking about at school where I was bullied for having like dark hair, for having a mustache, having dark on my legs. And some of the nicknames I got called were like monkey man, gorilla. And they sent me this email and they were like, those are slurs that people use against black people and mixed black people. So I don't see how you could have encountered them. Like what are you doing? And I was like, I didn't, I didn't make this up. Do you want to go tell that to like the 11 year old boys that were bullying me? Like it doesn't, it doesn't work the way that you want it to work. You can't decide how people enact their racism and you can't decide how people receive their privilege either. And I, I think when we try, try to quantify those things into like easily understood singular experiences, it, almost always just serves to narrow the kinds of conversations that we can have. And we end up going in these circles where, you know, like here in the UK, it feels like we're discussing, is BAME a useful term for like the eighth time in the last three years? It's like, we can never get out of these conversations because we're not, in my opinion, having conversations that are specific enough or nuanced enough. They just kind of end up very delineated to very easily understood things, which just comes down to, you know, the trauma of racism, which is like, fine, but can we talk around that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I, th I think it's interesting how that has impacted everyone's perspectives as well and how it shapes us into what we take with us. So I'm aware that um, we were supposed to go to um, audience questions so do we have any questions from the audience? I think I have to open the chat thing. So if you're watching along and you, and you have a question, please just type it into the chat area. I don't know if we should like give it a minute. I actually don't know how to view chat. There's a Q and A button. Oh. And there's a question. Yeah, there's a question in there. Oh, there we go. Any advice on how 
any advice on how to start navigating mixedness in your 30s, having spent all your life white passing, North African slash European, when not just race, but religion and culture are so diverse too. Over the past two years, I've realized I've spent 30 years denying half of myself. That's, wow, that's a very powerful question. I think, um, I mean, as you heard us talking about our experiences, uh, it is it is a difficult thing to start navigating. I mean, for me, I feel like I was navigating it from my earliest memories. So I'm not sure how, uh, if Jackson or Natasha wants to jump in, I'm trying to think. I think you, um, what can happen is that you wait a long time to find somebody else who directly reflects your experiences back at you mm -hmm. to help you make understand uh, to help you to make an understanding of your own experience and for so many people that for whatever reason is just not available to them so i think there's real value in first of all you know there's no pressure to label yourself there's no pressure to decide how how you define or how you make sense of your identity in the world immediately that can be a an ongoing process and it's no one else's business you know and you have the right to change your, your mind about that um but i would also you know recommend and it's great that you've you've shown up to this event this evening and um you know hopefully we'll read Natalie's book and, and Layla's book and Jackson's book and um, you can cherry pick, you know, the things that are meaningful to you in other, other mixed people's experiences to help you to kind of build that picture, almost like a jigsaw. Yeah, I think it's good. So I was at this festival in LA um, that I hope at some point continues again. And I hope I see both of you. It's called the Mix Remix Festival. And it's all about- Talking about this. Yeah, it's about mixed race art. It's just, it's, it's amazing. It's like three days of just, you know, mixed race artists in every medium. So like filmmakers, poets, artists. And uh, I was talking to this one guy and he was saying, you know, for most of my life, I just told everyone I was white, but he's actually mixed race, part Asian. And one day he started to identify heavily with his Filipino side. And the more he did that, the angrier his partner got with him, right? Because she was like, how dare you understand yourself in a way that I can't relate to or understand? And she didn't say this consciously, obviously, right? But it was a struggle because he's now fighting for the part that maybe he feels you can't see, but is there culturally, racially, historically. And I guess what I would say in answer to your question, Natalie, is um, find um, mixed race people who will help you embrace your hybridity uh, who will help you embrace not having to make a decision, but also find people in the community you feel maybe you've repressed out of the simulationist instincts, which we, which we all are sort of subject to. So you can embrace the side that you feel you identify more that you've sort of repressed so that you have people in that community and you can understand that there's a place for you in the coordinates of that community. You know what I mean? I mean, I think that's one thing that's important too, is just to start reaching out to that community that you, that you are identifying with more than you used to, you know what I mean? So you have allies, you have um, a sort of way of understanding yourself better. And also, I think really important is to defend your right to identify this way if you choose to, and defend your right to change how you identify with at any point in your life, and to not let other people decide that for you. Those things um, are sacred, but they don't seem that way. In the beginning, we all want to be understood and we feel pressure to make decisions about our racial identities, often for the comfort of other people or for ourselves. And uh, you have company, you have us, you have other members of who are you know, mixed race who will support you too. And you wanna find some of those people so they will support you to do the work for yourself. Mm. Both those answers were so beautiful. I feel like they need to be recorded just as like, you can go visit them at any point. Yeah, I, I really agree with both of you. And I think also not to, um, don't, not to like pressure yourself in terms of like, okay, I've been denying half of myself and now I need to like suddenly catch up on, on what is this part of my identity and feel really solid in that. Because I think 
it identity is a, is a really complicated thing and it's, it's also not a fixed point. I think when I was younger, I thought it was a fixed point. I thought I'm going to reach a point where I understand how to experience being all these things at the same time. And then I'll be done. And that actually is not true because you, who you are, your circumstances, your life is always changing. And I think all of those things can affect how you relate to your, your heritage, your religions, your cultures, all these things that you're talking about are so diverse for you. And if you feel a real pressing need to like dive into tons of literature, then great, go for it. But also I feel like don't, don't put that pressure on yourself. If you think, okay, I actually like, I am functioning. Okay. For now, I'm just curious about this. And I want to, I want to look at it. I think it, it goes differently for everyone. For me, it was a real problem, not understanding where I fit. And it was really negatively impacting me to the point of like basically having a breakdown in my teenage years, which I talk about in my book. And so I did feel this real pressure to sort of solve, solve this thing in order to be able to move on. But I have met tons of people um, who are my age and older who say to me, especially after this book coming out, who say things like, I've never thought about half this stuff and now I'm going to go think about it more or whatever. And it's like, yeah, we all come to that at different points of our lives. And so I also think a nice or nice, I don't know, a potentially useful place to start would just be connecting with kind of like Jackson said, anyone you have who uh, you feel relates to the part of you that you've been in your words, denying anyone from that culture, from that background. And if you have people in your family on that side of your family that you can speak to depending on your, your family situation. I think that could be, um, that could be helpful as well. Well, there's another book as well that I would really recommend that I read when I was at uni called, um, sugar and slate. And, um, it's by Charlotte Williams and her mother is white Welsh. Her father is, um, from the Caribbean, but he worked in, Africa. Um, so when, whenever she was um, amongst black people, it was mostly at where her dad worked in Africa, where she was seen as really, really light skinned. And then in the, the Welsh mining village where she grew up, she was seen as really, really dark skinned. And her whole life, she's oscillating between Wales and Africa. And she's got it in her head. If I can just make it to the Caribbean, I am going to finally feel home like I fit in. And the whole thing is about her journey of eventually making her way to, to the Caribbean, to the, the town where her father is originally from and getting there and realizing that she's Welsh. Um, and that's the thing that she most strongly identifies with actually is, is, is being Welsh. And um, so I, I guess the, the thing I learned from that book and my other piece of advice would be that don't, wait for that moment where you think, oh, I'm going to slot in and suddenly everything will fall into place because for a lot of people, um, you know, the realization that you have is not the one that you expect to have, let's just say. Mm. Yeah, that's really good advice, actually. I think I had that a lot as, as well of like, oh, I just need to meet another like Mauritian mixed, blah, 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 all the mix I am. I need to meet someone like that. And then I'll feel like I've got it. And like, still not happened <laughs> so it's like yeah i think that's really really good advice you you can't predict your own outcome um yeah but hopefully some of those things we've said could be helpful um but i really empathize with you it's, it is a difficult position to feel in if you feel like you're sort of not um honoring yourself in different ways or however that manifests for you so I don't know if there's any other questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go I was, on. I was just going to say, um, it's really important to, like, protect yourself, I think, as, you know, you're navigating this. Um, because people are attached to understanding you in a particular way. And when you shift, they will sometimes become very hostile, mm. you know. Um, when I went from my first name to my middle name, which is Jackson, um, there was incredible resistance. And... You know, like I couldn't get half my family to accept it for like 10 years, even though I was my birth middle name. And I think of that just as an obvious microcosm, right, of identity in any sense of the word. 
many people need you to stay static because it gives them, it's the North star for how they relate to you. And when you shift, they don't know where the fuck they are, but that's not your problem. That's theirs. And you have to go and navigate to whatever direction you need to go. Right. And if you have to say goodbye to some people, it's sad, but that's the best thing for who you are and the person you become. Mm. Yeah, that's really valid. I think as well, maybe to flag up, I, I'm thinking of some of my friends who are very white passing. And then when they've sort of started identifying with other parts of their ethnic background, they've encountered like a lot of people who are, who are not ready to embrace that in very problematic ways. So kind of similar to what Jackson's speaking to. And you do have to, yeah, you have to protect yourself. People will show you who they are. Or something that I found, I've obviously, um, as I've been talking about, I've always identified this this way. But something I found since my book has come out, I've had lots of my family members being like, oh, we always saw you as no different to your white cousins or your, your white family members. And so that's been interesting because it's like, well, I haven't changed, but your perspective is the thing that's changing here. You Because you were seeing me as white. You were seeing me as the same as these other people. And not white in the sense of you were seeing me as somebody with, who was literally white. You could see that was different, but you were functionally, functionally viewing me as a white person. And so it's on them to shift. And so your perception of yourself, the way you view yourself is allowed to shift and grow and be fluid and move around as many times as you needed to in your life. It can be constantly moving, um, in whatever ways you need to relate to your, to your background and to your heritage. But if other people can't allow you that space, that, as Jackson says, that's really on them. It's not, it's not something you can take on. Um, and you might get people asking you to explain the things for their benefit. And I think you just have to be like, I can't talk about you, uh, talk about this with you. You can go and look it up but I can't be the person that explains this because I've got my own stuff over here. And that has been something I think I, I thought I had learned that. And it's like an ongoing exercise of how do you uphold those things for yourself? Mm. So hopefully some of that can help. Um, and I don't know if we have any other questions. I'm looking for the Q and A thing again. No, it looks like just that one. Okay, answered. Cool. Okay, well, uh, in that case, if there's no other questions, we can kind of wrap it up there. So I just want to say a massive thank you to Jackson and Natasha for joining me tonight. This has been such an illuminating talk. I love talking about these things and it is so freeing to be able to talk openly and not have to sort of couch your answers in, I don't know, somehow narrowing them down. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. And I just want to, um, if you can tell us where people can follow you, where they can buy your works, how can we support you? How can we pay you? Uh, so yeah, please tell us. Um, well, you can find out more about my work at natashadevan.com. Um, that's all aspects of my work, what I do in schools, my campaigning. And also there's um, a list of all my books there. Um, Toxic is my first work of fiction, but I've written some non-fiction books um, in the past as well. Um, if you want to be helpful, then obviously buying Toxic and reviewing Toxic um, on wh whatever platform is your preferred platform is incredibly helpful. Um, and also if you're on TikTok, um, talking about Toxic on TikTok because um, book talk is massive, but I'm not on TikTok because I am too old. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah for me you can just just google me um yeah i just google me i mean i have a if you just go to my website you can order my books there and um or you can click on the link tree but um yeah just google me you'll you'll find it
We actually just had a question come in as we were just saying these nice roundups. So maybe we can just, um, I'll say we can find me and then we can just go around the circle and answer this last one. So this last question, if you want to think about it while I waffle, uh, is to end on an uplifting note, what has been the most positive experience of sharing your stories? Uh, so we'll answer that in a second. So to um, find me, I am at Leila Buzi on all platforms. Apart from, apart from TikTok, which I can't remember what my handle is. So that's really useful. Um, uh, oh, it's also at Leila Buzi. Cool. Uh, if you want to support me, you can I have a co coffee, coffee, I never know how to say it, link on my website. The best thing you can do is buy the book and review it, ideally on Amazon. Obviously, Amazon, boo, but also it is really helpful. So ideally review it on Amazon or on Goodreads. And I am going to, I was making a note every time we mentioned um, a different piece of media or a book, or whatever, I've just made a note here. And I'm going to tally them all up and put them on my Patreon. So you, you have to pay to subscribe to my Patreon, but I'm going to put it as a public post, which means anyone can see it. So if you were watching the talk and you thought that sounds really interesting, I'm going to gather them all and put them on there. And yeah, uplifting note, what's been the most positive experience sharing your stories? Natasha? I think it's been connecting with people like you, people like Jackson. Um, before, the only time I ever felt like I could breathe out was when I was with my siblings, when I was with my brothers. And, and I, I don't think I ever truly registered before at, how being with them was the only time where I kind of went, oh, this is nice. I don't have to be on the defensive or explain myself constantly in that way that, that you described. Um, but discovering that there is um, a whole community of other people who feel the same way and you have these reference points that, um, you know, you instantly understand without explanation has been um, a really wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with and Tasha was saying, I feel um, the gift of helping people feel understood and the gift of feeling understood has been tremendous. And it's something that I will never take for granted because I remember what it's like to not be understood, you know, at all and just be craving just a point of contact or connection or any report at all. Um, and I would say for me, one uplifting moment is I've gotten emails from people before who will just say something like, thank you so much. I'm like 16 years old and I read your book and um, this is the book I needed, you know? And that's why we do what we do. That's why we write the books we write. That's why we create the art that we create. Um, you know, we do it for ourselves obviously, but like that is what makes it so important is other people suddenly feeling understood and acknowledged by an artist who says, I get you, I know where you are and your experience is actually totally normative for us. So let it be normal, you know, let it be comforting and let this be one of a thousand stories and may you find inspiration to write your own through our work, right? Yeah, I agree. So hard same on both your answers. I think being able to connect with other mixed people working in a similar sphere has been an absolute joy. I, I didn't think I would find or meet as many people to connect with, even just, you know, both of yourselves and just some of the people that I've met has been really enlightening. And then, yeah, I think, I think having people engage with, ha having any form of audience or people engage with your work is always for me so fulfilling, but I think it's different with a work that is so kind of personal in nature. Um, it really does feel like when people are saying, this really spoke to me on a different level. It's like, wow, that's a really incredible thing to have had the opportunity for you to read my book. People are like, oh, thank you for writing it. And I'm like, well, thank you for reading it. Like <laughs> you have given me the opportunity to let those words get to you. And I was very grateful. So that's definitely been the most positive thing for me. And yeah, what a great note to end on. So thank you so much everyone for attending. Thank you to Housemans for hosting us and uh, for Zekra um, from Colour PR who organised this. And thank you ever so much, Jackson and Natasha, for joining me tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>